also call the supervisory team to order uh, at 6.33. Um, yeah, if you'd send it on those packages, that'd be great. <gasps> So the focus for this tonight's evening is going to involve a lot around this budget. Um, guys. You guys want? Do you need one as well? Uh, the agenda. Sure. It seems like we get the same answers every time. Yeah, it's true. We do. And that's it up for discussion. Um, it doesn't have to be an hour. We're looking through the... And we can decide whether we think that's valuable or not. Um, okay. I don't have the whole packet. It absolutely may but, not be valuable. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I guess some of it. I printed off at work. We used to have a form that would evaluate not only today's meeting, but also, or you could use the backup form. You guys should just share with the other yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we're we're this came with it. That um, came with evaluation of the oh, way we are conducting. Are we attributing supporting the policy government? We're sort of listing the policy and creating ourselves on that. We have, um, I don't know, two years ago or something, we asked our facilitator at one of our in-service retreats to give us some ideas on board evaluation <coughs> tools. And we never received them, to my knowledge. Well, I don't know. I, I wasn't chair at that point. Kate, Kate was maybe the um, go-between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I knew she didn't receive anything. Yeah. So, I mean, that's something we probably should follow up with. I've always thought that the meeting evaluator was, in many ways, just a way of keeping ourselves accountable. Not so much the actual evaluation doesn't matter so much as that we keep it in the foremost of our mind and take turns looking at the rubric and taking turns thinking about policy governance during, throughout the meeting and making sure that you know, our behaviors are not egregious. We, why don't we discuss it at uh, the retreat on November 20th? That can be one of the uh, items that we could discuss with uh, the BSBA person at that point. Mm -hmm. But for tonight, let's assign a meeting of value. Is there anyone who hasn't done it in, in a while? Or ever? I have it done. Brian? I will. Okay. You have the evaluation form or something? Um, last piece of the floor. There's one, I think, in the, the pile for you to sign, a folder in the back, and I think there's one in the book. Okay. Okay. Maybe I have one. Oh, yeah, I got one. Here's one. Here's one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, I'd like to welcome our guests. Um, we're going to start with a public comment period. Um, we're also going to allow for some public comment after our budget discussion. So if you'd like to hold your comments until after the discussion of the budget, that's also um, fine. Is there any one of you that would like to speak now? All right, um, so Lane, you're up first um, to, to review and present our budget. Yeah, so the, I, there's an actual kind of budget timeline. Um, we'll be coming back together uh, with the board three times, um, tonight being the first night, um, December, and then January. Um, each of those budget presentations will be slightly different. Um, tonight is what I like to call the ends budget. Um, it means that I sat down with the cabinet, hopefully they have talked um, fairly closely with the faculty, um, and taken a look at our continuous improvement plans, the board's ends, and had a lot of discussion about, okay, where are we at? What do we have left to do um, to achieve the goals that are in the continuous improvement plan to achieve the board's ends? And then they lay out on the table everything that they feel is needed. And that's what tonight is about. This is the everything. Um, based upon this meeting, um, based upon the open forums that will happen in the next month, um, I'll take feedback from folks. I'll bring that back to the cabinet. Um, we'll talk about what the priorities of the community seem to be relative to what our discussion has been, and things may be adjusted um, in the December budget. The January budget is the final, final budget that we're putting in front of the board with all the final changes, modifications, 
um, for their vote and their approval for passage uh, to go up in front of uh, the community at large. So to start off with, um, I think it's important to talk a little bit about kind of broad vision and broad goals. And then when we get to the actual parts and pieces that we're looking to add to the budget, um, it'll be a little bit easier to see where they fit in. Um, in terms of building a successful organization, um, there's a pretty simple formula for it. It doesn't matter what organization it is. Um, the very first thing that you do is you spend your time um, creating structures that are going to support your work, right? They're the protocols, they're the procedures, they're the programs, the schedules, the routines, the facilities, making sure you got the right mix of people and the right specialists to help you get where you want to go. The second thing that you do um, is most organizations have kind of multiple units that work together towards an end, um, is you make sure that each of those units has a very clear set of goals that it's striving for that when you combine them together, move the whole organization forward. And then the very last piece, once you've got those two pieces in place, is you work with the individuals within those units to make sure that they're the best that they can be. You provide them with the training um, that's required for them to do their jobs exceptionally well. And usually you're doing a little bit of each one of these along the way. Um, in terms of a school, um, it looks pretty much the same, right? The structure is the same. Um, that we've got to develop protocols, procedures, the classes offered, the master schedule, routines, facilities, right people, right mix of specialists. And we spent a lot of time um, over the last two years trying to make sure that we've got the right structures in place to kind of support the work that we're going to be doing for the next couple of years. Um, now that most of those structures are in place, the big, big, big focus is on curriculum. Right? That's the programs, that's, that's what we offer. That's what helps get this organization doing what it's supposed to be doing, and that's teaching and learning for kids. Um, and so that's going to be the next big step that you're going to see interleaved throughout the budget presentation tonight, um, is making sure that we've got a well-codified, aligned curriculum, um, especially at the, the high school level, to help drive things forward. And then the last piece, and we're going to have a little bit of this um, as part of the budget uh, flavoring that goes on tonight, is, is teaching quality. Um, making sure that the teachers have the tools to kind of evaluate how they're doing with the students, where their strengths are in terms of what they're delivering um, in terms of the curriculum, where their weaknesses are, and then the, the skills and the facilitation um, to be able to go after those weaknesses that they exist. Next year's budget proposals, right? They're designed um, to build on the structural pieces that were, were put into place physically this year, right? Because we're building the budget for next year, what we're going to add to it. And it's going to get us moving up the pyramid from structure building to curriculum. Um, talk a little bit about this. Um, we have a pretty good percentage of students who are doing very well. We've got about 50% of the elementary students who are, are, are doing pretty darn well at this point in time. Um, and about 20 to 30 percent of the high school students are doing pretty well. Um, the rest are struggling, uh, and those struggles kind of come in two flavors. Um, we have those that are academically based. Um, that's due to a poorly aligned curriculum or no curriculum. Um, in some cases, we, we do not have a curriculum. Um, poor instruction or simply just not matching um, student learning needs, um, how we're teaching to what the students need and how they need it to be taught. The other flavor, and one of the big pieces from last year, um, was the mental health piece, the trauma-based behaviors. Um, we had a lot of students who missed out on foundational ideas and concepts because their emotional health um, prevented them um, from being open to learning. Um, so if we want to be successful in terms of improving teaching and learning across the district as a whole, we've got to make sure that we're addressing both of these needs to make that happen. Um, so a couple of parts and pieces here, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail. On the mental health side, um, there's been a lot of discussions about moving to a true middle school model. In other words, taking the sixth grade from the elementary schools, bringing it up to RUHS, and having a sixth, seventh, and eighth grade middle school model. Right? Those students have very special needs. Um, they're going through puberty. Um, they need a bridge to take them from being dependent upon the teachers and the adults in their life to becoming independent. 
And when you try to do that training while students are going through puberty and all the other changes that are happening on that age, it's a tough task and it takes specialized in instruction and work to get them there. So, related um, to the middle school model that we've been discussing, um, because they kind of support one another, and is the, this idea of having a free full day uh, public preschool for four year olds. Right? That was the model we were moving to. We did the first step um, a year or two ago. We did the second step last year. Hopefully next year we can do the final step, which is getting that free um, full day public preschool. Why those two go together is because what happens is you've got the teachers that are currently teaching um, the sixth grade, or in most cases it's a five, six um, grade mix within a classroom. Um, when the sixth graders move on, those teachers will be redistributed within the elementary schools so that some of the elementary teachers are moving down into helping out and supporting the preschool, right? So that staff kind of waterfalls down and you get into the preschool. There's some other shifts that, that, that are going to happen because of this or potentially will happen because of this little bit more detail a little bit later. Um, one of the other big things that is going on right now um, is restructuring special education, how we're providing our services. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, as we go through the presentation later. Um, one of the big things that you're going to see, one of the big asks, um, is this idea of investing in the curriculum, um, especially at the high school. Uh, they've got some really good stuff that they do. Um, there's no doubt about that but it is not as aligned as it should be um, to what's expected and what's mandated. Um, and it's one of the reasons that our students uh, struggle a little bit. Um, and then the last piece that we're looking to for next year um, is the next step, is uh, creating a true science program at the elementary level across all three schools. So these are the major components. They kind of cross over to one another, but you have a track that's really designed to, to support students that, that are, are having the trauma-based issues as well as going after the academic-based issues that are more curricular in nature. So questions, anybody stop me along the way? There's like a million components to all these pieces, so. At what grade level does the true science curriculum start? They, pretty much middle school, they have science, a science curriculum at each of the elementary schools. Um, you know, Brookfield has volunteers that come in and teach a little bit about what the volunteer is interested in. Um, they have a little bit more codified one at RES, um, Braintree, you know, they have people that are coming in and they're doing science work, but it is not tied to next generation science standards. Um, and it's kind of mostly on a volunteer basis. Um, and so it's we more, talked... It's more like enrichment then. Yeah. And the, the reality is, is that that was common across the U.S. right up until a few years ago. Uh, when No Child Left Behind came in, right, that's where, you know, MCAS in Massachusetts and that's where your Vermont testing came in, they weren't focused really on science. They originally were focused on ELA and math. And so when people had tight budgets, what they did was they put all their money into the ELA and math and they did it by eliminating science at the elementary schools. I had science in elementary school. Yep. But that's... That was, that was one of the many, things many that, that was common. <laughs> so if you, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the testing scores across all the states, what you'll, what you'll usually see in, in states that have, have gone after it really hard, you'll see the ELA scores way up here, the math scores up here, and the, the science scores are always lagging 10 to 15 points behind. And it's because of that lack of focus at, at the elementary. So good questions. And same thing, audience, too. Um, you know, if there's questions along the way. We have done the the look at moving the staff around for the middle school model, no staff are gonna be losing jobs because of it, because I know that's, that, that's one of the concerns, but we wanted to keep things quiet about it, um, even though we were in discussions thinking about it, because it really is important for kids. Um, but we wanted to get that, that matrix worked out. A um, little bit easier at the elementary level, it's a little bit more complicated at the, the high school, middle school level. Um, just because of where the cutoffs are in the licensure. So it is possible at the, at the RUH level that there may be a, a staff member who may need to get a different level of the license that they currently have. But we would help them with that by, by helping them provision. So you don't envision many sixth grade teachers moving to the high school? No, and I'll, explain, I'll explain why. There was a redistribution. Um, we potentially are looking to add about two teachers to the, the high school to support the move. So two brand new ones out of the room. Again, this is just kind of the overview. Um, so so I, I've actually had 
someone talked to me about this over the weekend. Yeah. And they, their biggest concern was not necessarily, you know, pulling the sixth graders out of the, the elementary school, but the logistics of sixth graders being in this school. And, you know, is, is there, they were really concerned with, with the logistics of sixth graders being in the same building as yeah. 12th graders. So we, we took a look at the space. Um, the, the goal would literally be to have it set up kind of as a separate program in its own way. Um, so the space was the first consideration we'll look at. They will fit. It is possible. Well, th they will fit, but yeah. I mean, anyone that has students know that they interact with all the kids. Yeah. And that's where this person was, was really concerned was wasn't necessarily the you know structure but the interaction that the kids will have yeah. and mainly you know in and out of the bathroom areas yeah. with you know they brought up the uh, the uh, vaping issues in the bathroom with uh, putting sixth graders I mean you know rumor has it is you know a lot of the high schoolers come down to the middle middle school and and use the bathrooms for vaping so that, that's where the, the concern was more the actual interaction between the older kids and the younger kids. And if there's, if the, you know, how that was going to be addressed. So part of this is getting together an actual middle school team with its own principal, its own area, getting the team up and running once we've decided that this is the path that we're moving on. Um, letting them reach out to the research base. One of the facilitators that we're looking at to kind of come in for next year when I talked about the curriculum development piece um, would be a middle school person, specialist, uh, to help them make the best decisions in that. Um, so all those parts and pieces, they're the legitimate, legitimate concerns. Um, the, the reality is we get seventh and eighth graders, you know, as separate as they are interacting with the high school folks now. Uh, but this is um, an opportunity, and one of the reasons for the ads to staff is to keep it all separate different staff, uh, they're focused in a different modality with those kids, um, they're in a team mode, um, as opposed to, you know, the kids moving from class to class, um, and they're really focused in on the social emotional learning needs of those kids. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, you know, one of the, the pieces about academic improvement, especially at the high school level, is this, you know, this measure called time on learning. You know, how much time are the students actually spent being engaged with qualified teachers um, about academics and there's a lot of really good programming that's happening at the high school that doesn't quite meet that academic piece they got these wonderful advisories that they run but I question whether or not those advisories are here because we didn't provide those skills to the kids when they were at the middle school level and if we're providing them with that social emotional learning at the middle school level do we need as much time on advisories when we get to the high school and can that time be recaptured to be used for time on learning so we can talk a little bit about that as we go through. Uh, but good questions and good concerns. I mean, those are common. So middle school, full day preschool for four-year-olds. Um, again, potentially moving the sixth graders from the elementaries to RUHS. Um, goals, right? We've got to provide room at the elementaries for the preschools. Because we're adding a whole new class of kids. I mean, literally under this plan, you're adding a whole another year of learning for students. Outside of all the other possible benefits of, a, of, of preschool, we're adding a whole another year of learning for students. Um, so we need room within the elementaries to be able to do that. Um, talked a little bit about this, allows the elementary shifting personnel to cover the new preschool programs, right? There's this waterfall that kids move on. We don't need as many teachers at the high end at the fifth and sixth grade end. They trickle down um, into the, the, the preschool program. Um, it also allows a shift of one staff member to Braintree. Um, Braintree has been growing um, just like Brookfield by leaps and bounds. Brookfield got an extra regular education teacher last year to help them with that. Um, Braintree is in that boat now. They need an extra regular education um, teacher to help them with the 20, 25 new kids that they've had um, since their last ad to staff. Um, and then the biggest thing about it all is it is creating, we create a true middle school um, six to eight program at RHS to help those students with their needs. Um, talk a little bit about the preschool structure for, for potentially for next year if this moves forward that we're looking at. We would still have um, 
a partial day um, free for the three-year-olds. Um, you know, it would be nice to do a little bit more for them as well, but we'll, when we look at things, the three-year-olds, a lot of them are a little young to be in a full-day program. Um, it would be concentrated at Randolph Elementary. There would be a two-hour morning and a two-hour afternoon, just like now, um, to, to cover the three-year-olds. Um, there would be a full day free for four-year-olds preschool at each of the elementary schools, okay, 7.30 to 2.30 each day. Um, there would be an, what we call an extended preschool for four-year-olds, um, so that would run until 5.30. Um, that would be parent paid. It's not that expensive. It's up and running now. That would continue to run at Braintree. And because we are now one district, we can help prioritize parents. If we have parents that it's a priority that they absolutely have to have that after school component, um, that you know we can allow them to, to join at the, at the Braintree Preschool. So it allows them to the children to It's not perfect, but it's a huge step, um, potentially in the, the next direction. Um, Again, reason for preschool when we started to put it in last year is it's good for kids. It's a whole extra year of learning. Um, students that are in preschool are better socialized. They tend to be more resilient to the adversities that they face over the course of their lives. And historically, if you go to the research, two, three years down the roads, they are performing much higher uh, for the remainder of their, their educational careers than students that don't have. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons for this. Questions on the, the preschool uh, potential structure? How do they, do they, are they going to be taking the bus? Do they take the bus now? We've talked about that. Um, they're a little young. I know. Um, it is possible if there's an older sibling on the bus. You know, we talked about that. But we're still working out those details. It would be preferable for the kids to be picked up, dropped off. Um, other goal of this too, um, kind of the bigger picture vision of everything that's going on here, um, as all these things improve and, and, and make the district better uh, for students, is the hopes that we're going to continue to increase enrollments. Um, and I can't think of a better draw in the state of Vermont with all the troubles it has with, with, with child care and, and early ed uh, than having the, the full day through school. But, yeah. but, well, there's a burden on parents. But it is covering, you know, 7:30 to 2:30, which is a big chunk of the day, uh, which isn't happening now. I mean, a lot are still in the two, two-hour program. You did some marketing for this, right? Didn't you? Didn't you do a survey? Yeah, you did a survey last year. To yeah. see, yeah, especially good. with the Brookfield, we were getting ready to expand it into Brookfield. We just we wanted to make sure that you had folks were there. Were. Um, this is completely separate from like after school programming that's already in place at the schools, that would stay. Um, after school programming is for kindergarten and up. You have to do something different for preschool age students. Um, that's why we're, you know, I've got the name extended preschool on there. Um, the requirements to serve them in an after school program is completely different than what you can do with KDI. Just a little. Yeah. Um, so, we get grades six to eight at RUHS. Um, big thing about it is recognizing that these students have very specific social and emotional needs um, that the district is currently not able to meet very well given our, our structure. Um, right. One of the ways that I can say that and I can justify that a little bit is you know when we were looking uh, last week at the state and national testing, right? Um, the state and national testing looks very hard at what's happening at the elementary and at the middle school levels. It goes from, goes from three to nine mostly, so you got you know, a good chunk of the elementary, and then you got all the, the middle school grades in there and one high school grade, uh, with the exception of science. That does an 11th grade exam as well. But what you see historically in this district, despite the work that, that we've done over the last couple of years, is you see the kids doing pretty well out of the ele elementary school, and then all of a sudden, Right, when they make the transition up here in seventh grade, you see the shoots drop. And then it'll be middling, it may go up depending upon a little bit or it may go down, um, but there's always this huge drop. And I think one of the reasons is just because that transition is, is just so tough. I mean, they're kind of coming into kind of a high school environment right off the bat, um, even though they're still kind of in that dependent stage um, on the adults that are in their lives. Um, 
big thing um, about this transition is it's not an overnight thing. You know, you remember the pyramid that we kind of looked at at the very beginning? Um, the first thing that you build is the structures to support what you eventually want to accomplish. This is a huge structural change. Um, it doesn't mean that that one structural change is gonna, gonna fix things overnight. But what it means is it gets us into a position where we can start doing the next piece, which is getting in the specialists um, to come in and work with them on, on a middle school model that's going to support the social and emotional learning that needs to happen and start providing that to the students. So in two, or two or three years down the road after the change, you should see some pretty good, uh, pretty good um, improvements. Um, right, uh, provides what these student needs as they're making the transitions from, from young children to adults. Um, which is um, being able to bond with a, a caring community, right? They're with the same core group of teachers um, when they're in sixth grade, the same core group of teachers when they're seventh, same core group of teachers when they're in eighth. Um, they have mentors, they have advisors, that's a part of the structure. Um, and the, the advisory piece, it's really s focused on supporting that emotional growth that needs to happen. And because it's still working on a team, a seventh grade team, right? An eighth grade team, a sixth grade team, they are focusing in on all the students on their team and their needs. Um, so it provides a nice safety net. If students all of a sudden the behavior starts to change, if they start to struggle, if they start to fail, they're gonna recognize it right off the bat. They'll be talking about it and, and, and doing something about it um, as opposed to waiting um, and not knowing until something critical happens in the student lives. Talk a little bit um, about the special education restructuring. Um, the direct goal, the reason for doing this is to improve student outcomes. Um, we have a model right now in special education. Um, we've got fabulous people, um, but what it is really doing is it's managing the students' needs. Um, it is not getting the students to a position where they are, the majority of them are actually becoming independent, learning what they need to do for themselves. That is the goal of special education in an IEP. It is not to continually provide assistance. It's to provide assistance in learning the skills and the strategies that you or I need as an individual to be able to do it on our own at some point in time, or to get as close to that as possible. Um, and right now, I think that uh, you know one of the weaknesses in terms of our special education um, structure that we've got, and I've been looking at it for two years, is just that. Um, the way things are structured right now is we're managing kids. We're, we're, we're not helping them grow. We're not helping them move up. We're not helping them develop those skills and, and move on. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I believe that, right, and you guys have seen that in the numbers or in the ENDS reports, 21% um, of our students are on individualized education <coughs> plans. 21% of our students on IEPs, and the number goes up every year by about 1%. National average, 14%. Schools in Vermont that have a different structure than we do, their average is about 14%. It's about at the national average. So I think what is going on is we're not providing any of the kids on our caseloads, or very many of them, with the skills they need to move off those plans. So we're just adding and adding and adding until they graduate out. Don't know for sure, but if I were a betting man in Vegas, that's where I'd put my money. Um, and so, talk a little bit about the focus here. Um, current model, what we've got is we've got a caseload model, is what I'm calling it. So we get a new student that's identified, they get assigned to a special education teacher, the, te the special education teacher uh, works with them. Um, What's difficult about this is it's very difficult to absorb new students, right? Right now the caseloads for our special educators are around 24 students per teacher. If they're having to do a little bit of work with each of those students every day, especially since some of them cannot be done in groups, they're spending about 15 minutes per student trying to provide intensive services. It just does not work. Right? And I'm focused mostly on the elementary level. High school is actually fairly successful in terms of, and, and I mean that in a good way, in terms of special education service, services. 
Um, this is focused primarily on the elementary level. So what ends up happening, and we've seen the increase over the last couple of years, every time a new kid comes in that, that has special needs that moves into the district, all of a sudden we need a new, new body to go with that kid. New para. Um, after a few, it's a new teacher. Um, and one of the biggest problems that I see with this caseload model is, again, we are not focused on developing student independence. I cannot give you the skill to become independent with your learning disability with 15 minutes a day of time or less. Not possible. So what I'm suggesting, um, and this was after a couple of weeks of research, this was at going out looking some of what are considered the best models in the state is moving over to a, what they call a cohort or an embedded model. So we take one special education teacher, we assign them to three elementary classrooms. They work as a team with those three elementary teachers looking at the needs of the students that they have. Working out what the structure is for the service delivery. Is it co-teaching? Can, can you get a group of these kids together across these classes that all have a math disability and work on them in a group for an hour? Above and beyond what they're already spending in math class. Um, are there times that you need to do one-on-one -on -one work? And they triage and they work that out together. Um. My question is, with one a teacher assigned to three classrooms, I'm wondering how much that, I mean, first of all, the, the, the principal teacher in that classroom is m then having to manage these kids. If you have 21% or even 15%, it's a lot. Maybe behaviors or this or that, a lot of differentiated instruction. And does that teacher then, is, does that take away from he or she teaching the kids who want more or who are, you know, who are need so the, higher level teaching. The, the way to reduce that disturbance, if we want to put a name on it, um, in the classroom is to provide these students with the skills so that they don't need those supports anymore, which we are currently not doing. How does this model change without, because we're still working out the personnel piece of it, um, and that's something I can talk with folks about a little bit later um, in the, the evening. Is right now our special education teachers have an average caseload of about 24 kids per teacher. If we move to this model, it will be 16. They have more time. A qualified person who specializes in helping students with these disabilities has more time to actually spend with them with a very focused goal of providing the students with the skills they need to be independent. So that's a pretty significant um, decrease. The other piece um, for at least the transition year, which is why there's the two little stars next there, um, is that we put one paraprofessional per cohort. In addition to one special education? Yeah. And the team can decide where that paraprofessional goes. What's been happening in this district and districts across the state, which is one of the, the reasons for Act 173, is they're in a managing model. So every time a new student comes in, because we can't really treat their need and, and, and get them better, um, we throw a para on them to manage the behaviors or the symptoms. Never, never cures it, but it manages the symptoms while they're here. But every time you get another kid with, with high needs, you've got to throw another para on it. What this will do is allow the team together to be focused on their kids and their group, right, as a cohort, triage who is the highest need student, what do they need for services. Um, as they're working with the students, as the students are improving and progressing, what they can do is say, oh, our highest need student now, because of the work we've done, doesn't need the services they did before, so now that we can shift those services down um, to either somebody that came in or, or, or somebody that could use a little bit more of it's been identified. Um, but the paraprofessional is there um, to be a support when the, the teacher is not, especially for those first couple of years because we've got a high population. Now, this one to three ratio was not picked randomly. Um, the ratio in most successful models around the state is one to four. Why did I choose one to three? Well, because we've got a higher percentage of students in the district that are on IEPs. That's a little bit counterbalanced by the fact that we have a lower number of students in a classroom 
than the districts we're comparing to. We're around 17 and 19 at the elementary level where the schools that have put this model into place are 25-ish, um, give or take a kid or two. Um, so that was why the one to three was chosen. It wasn't done haphazardly. And again, the biggest piece of all this is this changing student focus. We are not managing behaviors. We are not checking off a list that I have provided my 15, 20 minutes of service to this student today. We are going in and saying, what is the student need? This student reaches out when they get frustrated and hits other children. Well, that's a very specific behavior. Well, we now have time to go after that very specific behavior, put some intensive um, time into it, so that hopefully, you know, within a few weeks, that behavior has changed, the, the student doesn't need that intensive support anymore. Um, the other piece to talk a little bit about this, you know, we've had this huge growth in paraprofessionals. We're up to 20 paraprofessionals across the um, elementary schools. Um, when we first started to work on this budget, I had folks coming in saying they needed to add another seven to the elementary level alone, which is one of the reasons why this hit, hit critical mass, even though we've been looking, looking at it for a little while. Um, the paras are great people, but they don't fix the problem, they manage it. Um, we need to be shifting um, what we're doing more to the, the professionals that can really focus in on the kids' needs and providing what they need to become independent. Um, one of the things about the paras that we have right now um, is that a lot of them are one-to-one. -one. When I go around and I do my observations, the students that they're with do not we need one-to-one -one paras. They might need a one-to-one -one for part of the day. They have a particular struggle in math. Or they have trouble changing their clothes to go outside for recess. That does not necessitate a one-to-one -one para all day. Under this model, the paras can float around, spend their math time with the student that needs it, shift over here at a later time in the day to help toilet this, this student, whatever the needs are. They can set that grid that way. Um, so the indirect goal here is to stop this double-digit increase of uh, cost that's been happening with special education. Direct goal, we do what we've got to, to start helping kids and getting them off the plans. The indirect goal is it'll save us money. We've gone up, I believe, 37% in the last two years in terms of our special education costs. Lane, I, I have a question. So yep. this is very reminiscent of probably five, seven years ago when the previous superintendent was doing the same thing for the same reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious. That was the failure because that didn't happen. The focus didn't change. Okay, because there was the whole the whole talk of the, now we're going to have the special educators working with the actual teachers, maybe co-teaching some, and then there, so... There was some beautiful planning, and there were some protocols that, that I pulled into the model that were developed from that time. For whatever reason, it was never followed through on. Okay, the protocols so, were never put into place. And the one piece that was missing was where the focus is. Okay. We're not managing kids. That's not, that's not the goal of an IEP. An old goal of an IEP is to get you independent at some point in time. Okay, so what I would like is I would like to see if, if we're gonna go with this model and if, and if, we can, if you can get the, the budget to, to do that is then I want to I want to see this is my benchmark. This is where we are now currently. This is where we're going. This is how I'm going to measure it, so that we can hold you accountable. So you've created this model. Give I, I want to see some projections of where you think you're going to be in in two years from now, so that we can go to the voters and say, okay, you you gave us this money. This is where we said we'd be. Here's where we are. So let me tell you what the alternative is if we don't go to this model. No, you, I don't. You're looking, you're looking at a 24% increase next year for special ed if we stay under the old okay. model. With, no, with no positive outcome for kids. But I'm just saying that, that I wanna, we need to be able to track. If we're, if we're going to do something, just like so five, that, seven years ago, was, we, we shifted over and, it, and nothing... You didn't shift over. That was the problem. There were good intentions. There were okay, plans and processes. That's why I want to have something in place so that we follow this 
and this is maybe our work as a board to make sure that we're holding your feet to the fire to say okay you've you're gonna give us some idea of of what your benchmarks are in terms of oh, by improvement the way, in special I'm education. I'm not asking for any money for this change. Okay, this is and cost that's neutral. fine, but um, I think we need to see, yep. is this going to work? How are you going to test to see that this actually so the, the end, end, produces the results that you're hoping the for? The special education team already did that work. It was in the okay. end report. What they did is they went off, they developed a rubric um, because what they are looking for as their end's goal, their end's goal is that over the course of time, students will either come off of IEPs or the severity of their IEP will, re will be reduced. Okay, um, so we'll see and that And so they developed point. a rubric. They actually went into their software system that they used to create the rubric. They actually pro programmed in where they can put in the, the numbers to track the rubric. So we have numbers to be able to track Great. this over time. Oh, so that was our, important. again, we talk about putting a structure in place and then the next step. So that structure was put in place last year. Excellent. So good, awesome, awesome questions, by the way, and I'm so, glad you brought that up. So say, say what you measure is, is the percent of students on an IEP mm -hmm. and you want to see what percent graduate or, or graduate from their IEP year no longer need an IEP. Say that's what you're measuring. So that's, that's How one. How you do it, that's you. That's you. Yeah. So the two things that they, they are, are looking at, and again, the way that, remember we talked about, it'd be nice to put the ends in the hands of, so the two things that they are looking at is they are looking at the number of students that come off IEPs or the reduction in the severity of the IEP, and they have a rubric to measure. Yep. And Great. it's all being tracked right within their... So that's all we need to know. Software really? system, yeah. Really. And my expectation, my hope is, is that they're sitting in front of you during the ends piece in a year, yep. kind of presenting that. Um, but, yeah. All right. So good, good pieces, and I appreciate. It. But the the reality and the, the big fact is we can't we can't keep doing things the way we're doing. We're not getting mm -hmm. the kids advancing, and the costs are just have been going through the roof. Um, investing uh, again, we're going to get into the numbers in the next slide. Um, next big piece of this, right? All these things that we're trying to do to meet the ends, to meet what's in the continuous improvement plans, to meet what the expectations are that the state and nation has for us. Um, one of the biggest pieces in, is investing in curriculum development and delivery. Now, one of the reasons when we look back at you know why 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 is the high school st struggling a little bit, at least in terms of performance on on, on these these tests and these exams. Well, most districts have a K-12 director, and along with that director, that director has a pretty good-sized budget for professional development, right? To pay people to come in, to work with uh, the teachers, to improve how they teach, um, to facilitate meetings um, with the data so that the teachers can kind of inform their instruction, right? Where am I weak? Where am I strong? What do I need to do about it? Or how can we come together as a teaching team to kind of address these issues? This has not existed in this district. It is not a surprise to me that the academics aren't a little bit better than they are without having the structure in place. And this is looking back years. Um, so it hasn't been there. Now, it would be nice to bring in a K-12 curriculum director. I'm not asking for that. I'm going to be asking for something different because I built a structure to try to compensate for the lack of a K-12 curriculum director. I have a K-12 coach in mathematics. I have a K-12 coach this year in um, ELA. And we also have at the high school, we have a director for interventions. Um, and the three of them have been working together the last couple of months in the role of a K-12 curriculum director. Right? We've put out a pull together a nice professional development plan based upon the testing, based upon the needs that they're seeing in the kids. Um, and I've, I think I shared that with the, with the board, you know, the, the beginnings of it a, a little while ago. Um, but where the investment is going to be is to bring in outside facilitators. Next generation science standards and how you teach that to kids and how you get them to meet those standards, that's a pretty darn specialized field. But I was in science and I knew it really well at one time. Um, but you're better off having somebody come in who specializes it, who works with it every day, um, to work with the faculty to get the curriculum in place and to teach them the process of teaching next generation the way that it's supposed to be. 
to get things up and running quickly, we are better off having facilitators come into the high school, um, work with them to pull together the threads of, of the curriculum that they already have, um, and join it together with what they should have, right? and create those full curriculums, um, and then sit down and work with them with the new assessment pieces that we've, we've built in over the last couple of years and really assess how the kids are doing in um, adjusting their, their, their teaching strategies to kind of match what the kids' needs are. Um, get it in, have it happen quick. Um, one of the things uh, when we invested last year, we talked about track my progress, we talked about the fact that they're starting to do the interim assessments each year. One of the things that was revealed from that testing that this team revealed when they were sitting down with folks and looking at it is we've got a real problem in terms of reading across this district. There is a high percentage of students who cannot read well at all. Um, and so one of the needs for a facilitator, and this is a longer term one, is to have um, somebody maybe from the Stern Institute come in and, and work with um, a very specific group of teachers, which I'll we'll talk about in a minute, um, to get them up in terms of uh, you know, how they teach reading to kids, or in Gillingham, Pontus and Pinnell. Um, they used to be trained in it at one time. Um, there was a lot of turnover, um, so that training has kind of gone away a little bit. But in grades K to 3, and at the middle school and high school level, there are real problems in terms of students being able to read well. We recently had a three-year, I believe, um, reading training. Um, but was, this is this these is pretty. These these people were here a lot. And yeah. The teachers would remember. This that. is pretty intensive um, training. So what we're looking potentially based upon the assessments is that K to three teachers. Mm -hmm. Um, and then K to 12, the special education teachers. Because by the time those kids get a little older, that's pretty much where they end up. So where is, we put a lot of time and, and a lot of release time and this and that into professional development in the last two years. Where is all that time going? Yep. So at the elementary level, um, and again, elementary is a little different than high school. High school, you can lead multiple strands because I have a teacher that teaches science, I have teachers that teach math. Elementary is a little bit more difficult because the teachers teach multiple strands, so you can only do one, maybe two things with them each year. Um, whether folks realized it or not at the, the last meeting when we talked about the ends, half of this district is currently jumping forward with leaps and bounds um, that have never been seen before, and that's across the three elementary schools. They've we're lucky enough that they had uh, UVM come in about five years ago, help them develop their curriculum. Um, they were struggling a little bit with implementation, so the, the principals pulled together to make that happen. Uh, they jumped onto the bandwagon when we started talking about formative assessments and getting the, the Track My Progress and the interim assessments in place, and they've been using that data to kind of address the needs of the kids, and that's the reason that you're seeing the improvements. So if you go back to the, that ENDS data, you're seeing that 5% improvement each year in ELA and math um, at the elementary levels, it's because of that work. What happened at the high school, um, we kind of talked about that. They had two huge mandates that were put on them, and a couple of the, the teachers that were in the audience at the last meeting actually spoke up about where their time was being spent. It was on the proficiency-based um, graduation requirements and the standards-based report cards. That had to happen. So they were spending pretty much every available minute doing that work. Uh, that work still needs to be carried on, still needs to be advanced, still be, be smoothed out, but it can be done by a small committee now. Um, the real work has got to be the curriculum at this point in time. So that's the focus for next year. And um, then part of it is getting these facilitators in place. So good question. Other, before we jump into the actual numbers? Now, now you're saying that most districts have a curriculum director. Yeah. yeah you're suggesting going with these outside facilitators I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, is this a Band-Aid, or do we, should we really try to fight the bullet and get a curriculum director? It's, I'm going to, I'm, there's, there's pros and cons to both. Both will get us where we want to go. Um, if I go with the facilitators, the work gets done quickly. I can, especially at the high school level, we can do multiple strands at once. I know that I've got the best and brightest in terms of the facilitators coming in that are up to speed on everything that's happening currently right here and now. Mm -hmm. Once they go, 
then the question becomes is the real need is you got the curriculum done, now you're at the top of the pyramid, you're working on teacher quality piece, and by that I don't mean to say that our teachers aren't quality, but in terms of, of delivery, um, helping them improve how they deliver instruction to kids so that it's more impactful. I've got coaches that are currently in place that can do that and do a pretty good job with it. Um, the reason that I worry a little bit about bringing in a K-12 curriculum director, yeah, I'd love one. Um, but they are not going to be as up to speed on each of the pieces. They're going to end up bringing in a facilitator anyway to do the work on top of the expense of having the curriculum director. And then once the curriculum director is done and I've already got the coaches here, what happens to them? Another question is, does do we let them go after, or, or how do you keep these curriculums up to date? Say, you know, yeah. five years after you know you're done with the facilitators, are these do these curriculums need to be updated every five they, years they, or whatever? They should and they should be checked every time that they are updated. Somebody should come in and work with work with the staff. So I, I mean, I just want to make sure that you, you know, that we're doing. If we're going to invest in it, let's invest wisely. And if we need it. Curriculum director for the long term. Yep. Just to really think about that instead of yeah pushing it off and then you know having to hire one later on. Yeah. Well, a curriculum. I have a, an equivalent structure for the coaching piece and the improvement piece. Um, right now, we can do this with facilitators, um, but it end, ends up like I said. My worry is that in two or three years, it's going to be the first position cut when something comes up because the curriculum work is done and the coaches are carrying out the work. Um, with the faculty. Further and more importantly, that I am not going to bring in a facilitator um, who is not going to actually train the staff so they can do some of this for themselves. And the piece that the staff need to, need to, to, to learn to do for themselves is the, the PLCs, the professional learning communities. You have department heads at the high school. They should be leading the data and analysis, um, data analysis and um, discussions with the faculty um, in their departments and helping them kind of hone in on, on where it is they need to improve and leading the discussions about, okay, in the last couple of years the kids have really done horribly on these standards, how are we going to teach it differently this year? And if we teach it differently this year and it still doesn't give us the improvements we want, then we know we've got to reach out to the team and say we've got some professional development needs. Um, and so you start to get that, that flow back up, so we're developing a professional development program with an actual professional development uh, budget to support those needs, if that makes sense. So the facilitators, there's a lot of, there'll be a lot of cost up front, still cheaper than a curriculum director, not by much in the first year. Um, it'll be cut in half probably by the second year, but there'll be an ongoing need. You know, as those curriculums get reviewed, especially with Common Core, usually they update it every, every four or five years. Um, you know, to have somebody come in and help them revamp and revise. Um, they try not to change that now. Um, they've done a lot of research on it for 20, 20 years. And one of the reasons that they try not to change it um, is because it's hard to hit a moving target. Okay. The first couple of years it came out every year, they changed the standard. It's like, dude, we just bought all these textbooks, we did all this stuff to support this, and now you, dang it, you changed it to this over here, and now we've got to retool the factory. You know? so, no, but very, very good, insightful questions. Um, Again, these are our best guesses. They are reasonably calculated to produce what we want them to produce. Um, they are not unreasonably calculated, and that's what you want to be worried about. Can't guarantee a thing, but I, guarantee, but I can guarantee that all these things are more likely to get us where we want to go than what we're doing now. All right, so the by the numbers piece, um, what we're looking at to support all this. Um, again, there's no value statements on any of these as we go through them. It's just what people are asking for. Remember that last year, um, Brookfield was struggling a little bit. So instead of having this co-principal model where we have three principals um, who spend most of their time at RES, which is what was going on, um, given the increase in enrollments that was happening at the smaller schools, we said, and the fact that we we're building a preschool, you know what, it might be a really good idea if we had a principal at each school, um, because they have licenses and, and capabilities that allow them to do things that uh, other people shouldn't be doing, um, that we're doing them um, in their absence. Um, so there's a liability aspect too, um, but just to have those principals in those schools was vitally important. Um, what is happening is we have the Randolph 
elementary principal who feels like she's lost a lot, and she has. Um, you know, she's not having the support from the Brookfield principal or the Braintree um, principal as, as much as before and is asking for an assistant principal. Now, the assistant principal benefits, and that number up there is for benefits as well as, um, you know, salary. Um, so 127600 um, there was a behavioral interventionist last year when I talked at the budget time when I talked about splitting them up. You know, they wanted the assistant principal at that time. They came back and said, well, you know, we'd rather have a behavioral interventionist. So we did get them the behavioral interventionist. That person would have to be given up um, if we went with this model, but that would produce a little bit of a savings there. You get the total cost um, increase at Randolph Elementary down to 91.6. At Braintree Elementary, if you go by the numbers, um, right, if we do this middle school, uh, preschool move, um, they would have a teacher come over from RES that would mitigate, you know, their, their increased population. That would be a zero cost. Um, they have an interventionist right now. Again, we're trying to move folks out of the, the title budget, right, the title funds, um, who is still .2 in. It would be 16000 to move that person out. And this is one that's directly related to the board's ends, um, increasing the librarian um, to do two days per week um, at Braintree Elementary to support the digital literacy curriculum that they created last year, right? Technology is a board's end. We created the curriculum. We need the, we need the resources to be able to actually deliver it to the kids. Um, so the total increased cost for Braintree Elementary, we're looking at 29,930. Brookfield Elementary, well, they already got their, their person last year to, to, to deal with their increased enrollment. Uh, they got a regular ed teacher last year, uh, but the same thing. Um, to deliver that digital cur literacy curriculum, um, the librarian would need an extra day a week. So an additional $16,030. Why is that number different than the brain tree number? The um, there, there are people currently in those positions. One has, more, has been around here longer than the other, so their salary is higher. It's a good question. Uh, preschool costs. All right. So there's a lot of shifting go going on in terms of um, teachers, right? If we have had this middle school model go into place and we go with this preschool model, um, we have the structures in place at all three schools now, but we've got to bolster them a little bit. Um, the half time teacher that's currently at Braintree would have to increase the full time, same thing at Brookfield. Um, and then we'd need a full time pair at RES. And then there's also some room um, renovation work that has to be done to, to support the younger kids. They need extra plumbing, extra bathrooms, extra sinks, um, and some extra extra su supplies, um, especially for out at the, the playground, um, to kind of support their needs in terms of what the state would require. Um, so the total jump to get that uh, preschool in, um, so again, full day preschool for four-year-olds at each of the elementaries is 117 five. And the goal of this is I, to reduce, like, the idea is that it will help them later on adjust. So do we have statistics of students who have gone through the preschool program and how many IEPs they have in relation to students who have not? We could poll them, but we haven't had a full day. So it's hard to tell at this point. Yeah, I wonder if that's something we could track to see, yeah. like, is the preschool actually making a difference? Yep. Yeah. No, they'll, they'll be tracked in the same way that the other IEP students are, right? That system mm -hmm. is in there. Mm -hmm. We identify the students early, um, mm -hmm. right? Usually it's kind of interesting, the ones that are, are coming in now into the preschool program as well as kindergarten, um, the biggest need that they have is, is, is speech, speech mm -hmm. therapy, um, which is one of the things having reading the reading training and the reading specialists working on the reading at preschool should help. So this, like, hopefully is an investment in yeah. reduced costs later on. Yeah, our, um, when we originally looked at this, right, we, we talk about trying to improve the academic achievement of the students, mm -hmm. um, but we also try are talking about trying to make those IEP students independent, give them the skills to be independent. This was one of the yeah. pincers in terms of trying to fight that battle, mm -hmm. um, trying to provide the services. Good question. So if you look at the, the totals across the elementary, so these aren't in addition to what we just had talked about. This is just summarizing together, you know, the three elementaries we're talking about, 26660. Um, the other piece that's in there, um, you've got the subtotal of the three elementaries. 
Um, the other piece that's in there that we didn't talk about, right, is they are working together with a facilitator to get the science program in next year. They need supplies to do that. The facilitator has come back and said about $1,500 per grade based upon what you already have. Um, that's just to have the materials um, for the science program. RUHS. Um, right? We talked, a, uh, uh, we talked a, a lot about the reasons for the, the middle school creation, so I won't go into that again unless people have questions. But to kind of make this happen minimum, minimally, we need two teachers. Um, they have some capacity with their teaching staff. There's one person who could be moved down um, because they do have s small class sizes. Nothing wrong with that. It's great. But there is some capacity to absorb. Um, so two teachers. And then con conversion of our assistant principal, right? We've got an assistant principal and a principal at the high school. Um, converting that to a principal to oversee the middle school program. You know, a, a little jump in salary to make it um, comparable um, where it should be. Um, the other discussion that, that went on that's not in that total at the bottom is the hiring of a permanent sub. Um, they hire quite a bit in daily subs. Uh, they have a daily sub every day. It would be nice to just have one here permanently. It would give them benefits. But we talked about changing the structure a little bit of what a da daily sub does. Um, this permanent sub could, you know, set up in one of the areas in the building and, and cover, you know, the classes for two or three teachers as opposed to just one. Uh, there is not a lot of benefit um, for a daily sub. They come in. Um, they are not educators. Even if they were teachers, they'd have a difficult time teaching a class for one day from a, for another teacher. Um, they're basically just there caretaking the kids. Um, so there are a lot of other models that you can use. You know, if the kids can show up, they can see on the door that their teacher is out. They have their assignment for the day. They can write it down. They can go down to the, the CAF or the library or one of the, the, the labs with computers. can sit in there and they can do the work and this person can be there to oversee. Um, district level. So curriculum facilitators, what are we looking at for next year with this budget? We're looking at a, a reading facilitator to come in. Um, that K to three, and then the K to twelve special education folks, right? Provide training for them in reading to try to address the reading problem we're uncovering. To go into RUHS, help out in ELA, um, take the pieces of the, the curriculum that they've got, tie them together with everything that they should have, get it up and running really well. Um, get the math curriculum at RUHS up and running really well. Um, develop the K to twelve science curriculum. And then if we move to that middle school model, it's also will fund a facilitator to come in and work with them on setting the middle school up for best practice. How is it structured? How do you work with the kids? What are the advisories about? How do you do the social emotional learning? I mean, it's a project. It'll take a couple years. Um, but the first step is getting the kids together in one spot. Um, $10,000 increase to the legal line um, because we don't know where negotiations are going to go or end for next year. They may go beyond um, this, this budget year because of the, the drawn out nature of the, the state negotiations on health care. Um, software um, to support the curriculum work. Um, there are a couple of really neat science programs um, that are out there. The kids are already using one. They're using history science right now at some of the elementaries. Um, but making sure that that's available for all. And then $8,000 because of the bandwidth increase. When the system moved to a one-to-one -one system, the Chromebooks for every kid, there wasn't enough bandwidth to support them all using the Chromebooks at the same time. Um, so this is an $8,000 increase um, to support the new costs um, with the fact that we have upgraded. And the other thing that's happened is across the country is there was some Fed money that was coming in to help kind of support that. That's gone away for everybody now. Um, it's about 116000 at the, the district level. So that is your, your cost. Um, you know, when I start talking about having the facilitators come in, um, and getting that work done. Um, if you were going to bring in a uh, curriculum director, they're paid about the same as a superintendent. Um, so there's a uh, fairly significant you know, cost difference between the two. That 88000 you know, it would be nice to keep that year after year to do the work. Um, but if they get the work done next year that we're planning on them getting done, um, that could probably be cut in half. And at some point in time in the future, get cut down to about a third. Um, to bring the facilitators in and never there's any updates or upgrades. There was a lot of discussion um, about athletics. 
Um, it would be nice, you know, I was kind of looking at the comparables, there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of folks out there that have a full-time AD director, but there aren't a lot of full-time athletic programs out there either. Um, in a lot of cases, what happens is that you have a PE teacher who, you know, may teach two or three classes of phys ed and the rest of their time is AD, they're paid as a teacher. What I would like to do is just uh, set things up so that our new athletic director who is coming in, um, next year is actually just paid on the teacher's pay scale. It would be a $3,000 increase to his, you know, his current salary that he's coming in at. Um, and it would also hopefully help us kind of retain folks uh, for the long haul. Um, we've talked an awful lot about with, with, with Steve um, when I was meeting with him about the needs of the turf out there. Um, there has never been a turf maintenance program. Um, those soils get compacted as the kids are running around on there, as the vehicles drive over them. Um, they get hard and it means that you are going to get more and more injuries. Um, there is nothing but crabgrass out there, which is not the softest stuff to be landing on. Um, Steve pulled together a three-year turf program. It would be 23000 the first year, 13000 the second year, and probably about half that again in the third year. Um, just to deal with the compaction issues and, and get stuff growing out there the way that it should just so that it's safer for kids. Um, there was a groundskeeping person um, that needs to kind of be reinstalled, so that's separate from having the, the specialized crew come out and do the, 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 the turf piece. Um, this is the person that, that does the lines, keeps up on all the equipment, gets the equipment out, puts it out, brings it back. Um, it was a normal part of here at one time. That's what uh, Wes used to do. Um, where it went, I don't know. I've been trying to track it through the budgets to see what happened to the position, but it just disappeared one time. Um, so it's putting that back in. Um, adding a couple additional hours um, for the trainer, the athletic trainer. You know, we've built a room for them. Um, they're here for all events with contact sports, right? We, we contract out to Gifford. Um, it would be nice to give them a couple more hours after school to help um, injured students actually work with them each day to help them in their recovery, um, as opposed to just, you know, when something critical happens right then and there. Um, and then just to keep in line with what the budget has typically been for supplies and equipment, um, replacement and repair, and the increase in terms of uh, the cost of having the police come out and do details. Um, I was looking for 9900 so 71000 So questions on that? lot in the long presentations. I apologize for that. But again, like I said, this is the everything budget. Facilities, uh, what they're looking for is, um, you know, we, we did a lot of work in terms of, of fixing around the schools, but the door hardware um, does wear out over time. And what I'm talking about in terms of door hardware are those panic bars, those bars that you push on that open up the door. Those darn things are anywhere from one to $3,000 to replace. And they wear out. You know, we have a couple of uh, we have a couple of doors, and they have to they have to be on them, right? You have you can lock the door to keep people from coming in, but everybody's got to be able to get out um, under the fire code. Um, there's a couple of doors around the building that even though they're they're locked up because the hardware is, is old and worn, you can pull on them. If you pull hard enough, you're going to be able to pop the door open. Right? We had the theft last year. Um, was part of. Um, the repairs and maintenance are looking for a nine thousand dollar increase just because that's more in line with what that line is. Um, supplies, it's the same thing that's more in line of what's actually been spent over the last couple of years. Um, providing uniforms for the workers, um, especially protective stuff, you know, uh, boots and coats and overalls to protect them from the chemicals that they use. Um, desks and furniture replacement, there has always been a very minimal amount in there to replace desks and furniture that, that wears out and gets damaged across the district. Um, 45000 for equipment replace field and a generator in Brookfield. So 4,000 of that would be for equipment replacement. Um, the 41,000 would be to get a, a generator in place at Brookfield. It is the school that loses power most frequently. We just had to move the kids to Randolph Elementary one day already this year. Um, and it would be nice not to, to do that, to know that uh, you know if the power goes out, we can keep them in school, lessons can continue, um, and they have flushing toilets and heat. Because if the power goes out, we don't have that. Um, an increase to rubbish removal, because that's what the cost is. There was some stuff in the maintenance budgets over over time that um, you know were never adjusted while we were under funding. Special education, and again, this is under the the old model. Um, right, we got some predicted outplacements. In other words, we have students that are 
need services beyond even after all the accommodations that we tried that can't can't be here anymore. Um, that would be going to outplacements um, that we need to pay for. Um, and this is after we've reduced their paras. Right? They had a pair one to one para, most of them with them while they were here. That was the, the highest step in that tiered intervention with them. Um, so those paras would be a reduction. So that number takes the reduction of those paras into account. Um, and then we talked a little bit. Um, a little while ago about you know the biggest need for the, the youngest kids coming into the district for, for speech. Um, so we need to increase our speech line. Other pieces, and because it goes into strategy for negotiations, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail um, about what those, those numbers represent, um, but uh, predicted uh, amount needed for the Salary increases across the district is 784. Um, the health insurance increase for next year, um, barring anything major coming out of the negotiations, which I don't expect to happen, is 228. This in executive session, I can go into a little bit more detail on what it actually means, but again, some of it has to do with the negotiation piece. And overall, okay, so again, big thing about this is we are just looking at expenses. Right. We don't have the data from the state to look at what our potential revenue increases are next year that might balance some of this out. That won't happen until around the first week of December. So we're just looking at potential expenses. Um, we don't know what's balancing. If we're just looking at the expense piece, um, those are what the potential increases are. Again, just a clarifying question for me. Last year you presented, when we had this dream budget, you presented a few things that you didn't truly believe in, just they were asks from teachers or parts of the school that you presented to us. So I'm just wondering. That'll be, so part of, part of this discussion is to get a feel from this body and folks in the audience where this sits and where this stands. Okay. What they think about the parts and pieces. And then I can bring that back to the cabinet and say, hey, this isn't going to fly. Okay. Now, again, the, the piece that I want to point out that's difficult right now is this is just looking at, at what we would potentially be spending next year. We've had a lot of revenue increases in the last couple of years. We've got more kids that have been coming in through school choice. Um, our ADM is up. In other words, our average daily membership, how many students we have. So we get more money. Every student we get is worth another $10,000 that we get from the state. We don't get those numbers until... And so that may very well balance out a good chunk of this. One of the things that I do want to point out is, you know, we're talking about improving the, the academics and some, some major changes here to help kids. You know, 1.4 million, 784 and 228. You know, there's, your, there's a million of it right there, close to. Again, we'll talk about those pieces in more detail. So questions on any of this. So it's a precursor. It's a precursory look at where the discussions are, what we're talking about, um, what they're geared to. You know, these changes, what they're geared to affect. You know, in terms of better outcomes for kids and meeting ends and, and, and meeting the, the continuous improvement plan needs. But questions, thoughts. How does that compare to last year's increase? Because you increased last, last year was year. almost twelve percent. It was a 12 percent change. 11.7, I believe. 11.7 last year. Yeah. And again, this is the and this is last, this a, is the equivalent of last year's dream budget. Okay. And how much of a tax increase did that end up being per I town? Mean, yeah, Do we'll we pull know up that? the presentation for you for each town. I think I think I think I think my tax increase was 200 bucks. Okay. As a Randolph resident with a moderately expensive house, um, I can tell you. And at this point, we don't know the, imp the tax increase. No, because we don't have those ratios. We don't have any of that from, um, from the state until early December. So, but what I can do is if you want, when we do the next budget presentation, is I'll pull up all that data, and you can, I can show it to you side by side. Mm -hmm. Because one of the biggest discussions um, last year was the idea is trying to, trying to, trying to press reset. You know, are we committed to making this a district? Um, you know, 
or are we committed to just always keeping things very fiscally tight regardless of the impact on kids? Mm -hmm. um, and again, but again, this is the word that you used. I'm calling it the ENDS budget. Is it's the dream budget? This right. is the so everything. I so I haven't asked anybody to cut anything at this point in time. And that I guess that's my question. As as we sort of oversee your work, I'm asking what oh. you think is important to. Um, you're going to throw me to the dogs on this. And <laughs> well, and, and I'm just wondering what if there are any parts of what you presented to us that you don't really think we really need. Yes. <laughs> and again, you know, I this is my gut looking at things after talking with folks. Let me pull this back up here. So the board has to, the assistant principal I don't think is needed. Um, in terms of the d digital literacy, that's important to me. It's a low dollar amount. It's important to the board. It's an end. Um, but in terms of, of other cuts and things that need to happen, um, you know, if folks want to get things down, that would probably be one of the, one of the more likely to go. Um, moving the interventionists, um, you know, there are things that I can do. We can keep them in title. I can't guarantee they'll be there next year, though. Again, the, the rule of thought and what the AOE was saying was three years. Either by three years you've solved the problem or it's such a need that it needs to be in the regular budget. So that was the, the purpose of trying to pull those folks out. Um, same thing with this, again, but it's small dollar. Um, you know, do, you, do we want that preschool? I think it's critical. I, I think it's critical, and I think the middle school is critical. Um, looking at the numbers, seeing what's happening in the district, I mean, you've got very highly qualified teachers that are passionate about the kids, that care deeply about the kids. They need the structures to help them do their job better. And these, these are things that will help them with that. Um, science programs, critical. Um, Permanent sub, not, not worried about it. It's actually the reason it's in red is because it's probably cost neutral anyway. Uh, district level. Depends how fast you want to get try to start getting things improved at the high school. Could we cut back? Oh, yeah, we could focus just on math or we could focus just well, on... I just am asking what's important to you, right? Um, so so the, 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 the two, again, without talking to the cabinet who... Their input is invaluable. Um, the two easiest for me are the, um, the digital literacy, but again, the board would have to accept that we're not meeting an end. Um, and then the assistant principal at Randolph right. Elementary. Thank you. And again, we haven't talked in detail about you know, the derivations for the salary increases and you know, impact of that should be an executive session because of the negotiation piece of it. Does the board have any other questions or comments um, on this subject? If not, I'd like to open it up for public comment. When you do this, can you, um, for the next one, can you just show us sort of spending trend mm -hmm. from you know going back a couple mm -hmm. of years, or maybe from the time you started? No, I, I did that. I think I have that from last year. I think I went back about 10 years. So, yeah. easy enough. I did the presentation last year. And that usually, and the number of students. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just so we have an idea. I think for me, uh, just an initial look, I think um, it's, a, it's almost an 8% raise. Um, and last year, we had went with 12, almost 13 or something like that. And it, it was kind of a promise. To community that because you're going to do this, we will probably won't have another huge increase. In half of what it was. It's half. Like yeah. I'd still say that's kind of high. Yep. Like, I, I would mm -hmm. say, uh, based on what we were saying last year, I would have expected closer to a five percent or something like that as a reasonable ask. But I think if this is kind of a but from my point of view, it's kind of high. Yeah. Well, this again, green budget. Yeah. So, but that's that's part of the reason to do this is to get a feel for what 
people feel is important um, and what's going to fly. And one of the things that we had kind of talked a, a little bit about um, too is the, the idea is as a board, you know, one of the things that sometimes the board does, you can do whatever the heck you want, but it's not going over this percent and blow on. And then what we do is then we take that and we go back and we prioritize on, on what's most important for this year. And that's a perfectly acceptable. Well, get, given the way that education funding happens in Vermont, too, I want to wait until we know what kind of impact this really means mm -hmm. on people's property tax bills. Yep. Um, because, you know, we, we are a receiving town, and, and so what, do, what will this actually look like in terms of the value of somebody's house and their actual property tax. Yep. Yeah, and so we, I did those calculations last year. I'll do them again this year. It's just yeah. we don't have the right. Issues. I right. know you right. don't have that information, yeah. so we'll have to wait. But yep. no, the good stuff. It, it makes it awfully hard to judge. I mean, okay, you went up that much, but what is That's the real the impact yeah. on on the average person's property tax? We don't have any clue at this point. I mean, those session. numbers are going to be anything else Different from the board? Or the no, that's what I was going to ask you guys. <laughs> so state your name and, and ask ask away. So Julie Heyman, I've taught fifth and sixth grade for 14 years and sixth grade math. Um, I have some thoughts about the middle school change. I just am not ready to articulate them. Is it possible to just send the board an email with my thoughts at another time, or is there a better way? to communicate my thinking. Yeah. I think that's fine. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm a parent of a fifth grader um, and a parent of an eighth grader, um, both here in Randolph. Um, I definitely have some questions about the middle school um, and some concerns that I also would like to articulate. I came to this meeting to hear um, people's thoughts and I definitely appreciate your time, um, but I'm, I don't think that I'm ready quite right yet to really speak to what all of those are. It's a lot to take in right now. So I'm going to be doing a, a, a forum, um, I think it's a, this week, it's the 15th. So the high school has theirs, I believe, on the 15th. I usually hang out um, with them and I'll hang out for an hour or so afterwards. Um, so if you want to connect directly with me or you know, the board, you know, meets again in a, in, a, in a month, or if there's things you can usually communicate directly with Laura. Are you going to be presenting this in a community forum, sort of? Parts and, yeah. yeah that's um, the because goal. it is a, such a huge change that I think, I'm, I'm sure there are lots of people who have questions and. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the same process that we did last year. Um, the, the goal is, is that when we get to the annual meeting, nobody shows up because they've already heard it all. Right? <laughs> I mean, I guess that's just the, the biggest concern um, just in thinking of putting all of this together for next year um, is really concerning. Uh, it's just I don't feel like there's a lot of time. Um, and I do feel like I have to speak for the fifth and sixth grade team at Randolph. I mean, they're amazing. And I think they do an outstanding job. Um, challenging our, our high kiddos and I think they do a really good job um, you know helping our kiddos that need support um, and I know that I'm not being very articulate right now yeah no that's um, but I feel like our kids are in a really good place when they leave sixth grade and um, I just I would hate to see them lose a year of what I would consider to be excellent school so that's just yes yeah. but I'm you know I yeah I don't know the other thing too is if, if there are ideas that come up because it's it's nice there's some beautiful ideas that come from the community at times mm -hmm. oh we didn't think of that or no nope, that something that we really need to consider um, it's just you can connect with me too I'm pretty pretty easy to get a hold of them and pretty open in terms of people coming in and meeting so if, if other ideas come up along the way, um, if that's a preferred avenue, just come talk with me. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? So I actually have a question. So this is new to me, hearing this this evening about the middle school. I think I must have missed 
one of our board meetings. I apologize. Um, but has this had input from our current fifth and sixth grade teams at the schools and the principals? Uh, it's had input at the cabinet level, I believe, um, because we were going to potentially talk about it tonight um, until we were kind of sure if we could even do it, right? We had to check, make sure that there was space, that it wasn't going to have a huge impact on the cost of staffing, that we weren't going to be losing people. Um, we wanted to get all those logistics done first um, before we started talking about it more openly. So those steps are yet to come. Okay, so you. So I was able to sit here tonight in front of folks on camera and be able to say that if we do this, we're not losing staff. We wanted to make sure that that was a question we could answer before it was brought up publicly for the first time. If that makes sense. And mm -hmm. I certainly do appreciate that um, because I think that the staff in these schools, in these elementary schools, are excellent. Um, mm -hmm. As a parent of two who have successfully graduated from sixth grade, um, I just. I guess I'm sensitive to these teachers that are at that level and then it seemed like a very um, easy comment that they would just drift down to a different grade level teaching. Um, and I just would want to make sure that those teachers want that, that that's something that's satisfying to their careers or as we think about that transition over here, whatever teacher they may need. Um, we have excellent teachers over, I can speak to the Randolph Elementary, and I would hate to lose any of them because they had to drift down to a younger level or lose the position they have. So I guess I just want to be sensitive to the teachers, mm -hmm. what they want, and to make sure that they have feedback in, to this process as well, that it's not just happening at the cabinet level, yep. would be my request. No, that, again, the only reason that it's been on the, the hush hush as well as the, the special education piece is because we were working out the logistics to be able to answer questions about what impact is this going to have on jobs. Okay. We wanted to make sure that we understood that fully before it was brought publicly. So we had the principals kind of reach out for the first time, I think it was on Friday, right, at the, at the PD day and kind of talk a little bit about it. Um, and this is the beginning of that conversation, potentially. But recognize, um, one thing that is very important, um, the middle school and the, the full day preschool are tied together. It's hard, it will be incredibly co costly um, to do one without doing both. Um, so this, you know, we still could, but it would, it'll change the matrix of cost if we decide, oh, no, we don't want to do this, but, you know, the other's okay or vice versa. Um, so that's a part of the discussion as well with the community. Now, kind of going on top of Ashley's comment, has, has anyone thought about, you know, the, the general public? I mean, this is kind of a cultural shift. I mean, mm -hmm. these, you know, sixth grade has always been at the elementary school for years, and it seems to be really working well right now. Um, and Take a look at your seventh grade data, tell me that. <laughs> well, Take that's what I'm saying is, you know, the, 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 the high school... <laughs> <of> the move. <laughs> The, the high school seems to be the issue area where the you know K through six seems to be doing exactly what you know everyone kind of wants them to do. And is this shift going to disrupt those sixth graders too much and that education portion of it? Anything's possible, yeah. but I, I can tell you that the middle school model is well researched for decades, if not centuries. There is a, a reason for it. One of the reasons, you know, it's very hard to point at a very specific reason for why things are, are lagging um, when you're dealing with people. But like I said earlier, one of the reasons that we may be having some of the problems at the high school level that we have is because we've had to reduce the time on learning to deal with the social and emotional needs that those kids still have because we didn't meet them in their earlier grades, specifically the middle school level, not at the elementary level specifically from this stuff. It's a good it's a good argument. I've got data to support it. Can you prove it with people that it's absolutely true? No. I'll be the first person to admit that. Um, but I, I I don't want people thinking because this is the first time that it was discussed um, 
that there wasn't a considerable amount of thought that went into this the middle school idea we've been actually discussing at the cabinet level for two years now, if not more, um, and the need in terms of addressing the, 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 the needs of the kids, the social emotional needs. So. I guess as I'm speaking more, more as a community member than a board member, um, my biggest concern with that move is, is what Brian touched on earlier with the with the sixth mm -hmm. graders next to the twelfth graders, and how do you how do you create? And I don't and mm -hmm. I'm not familiar. I didn't go to this school. I'm not familiar with how things work structurally here. But how do you create a physical barrier so there's some separation? Yep. I went to a middle middle school, a six, seven, eight middle school, and um, and it was it was fine. Mm -hmm. It was a great place to learn, but it was it was physically separate, separate. from the high school. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, it was the athletic fields were in between. There was no sharing of hallways or bathrooms. So I think that's a big yeah. So the, the that would be my biggest concern. So so the the goal and the trick, um, like I said, the, that plan is already there. Is we pull together what the middle school team would be, the development team with the facilitator, and then we pull that out. Um, and we take from the open forums and the, the community discussions um, what the concerns are that, that, that folks have, um, and either we're able to address them through that model, uh, right, in terms of the, those discussions. Or if we can't, then maybe the community doesn't support the move. Um, but that's the stage we're at now. So we're, we're introducing it. We're talking about what the financial impacts are, what the personnel potential impacts are. Um, now it's time to take a good hard look. But ultimately, it's your decision to do that. It's whether or not the community decides to pay for it. I won't. I won't right. do it if the community is not supportive of it because it just stuff won't fly. Okay. Um, I will come back and say you didn't help me meet the ends if you beat me up on the, on mm -hmm. the scores. Mm -hmm. um, but that's part of the course, that's part of the give and take. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think for parents in the community, knowing that their sixth grader isn't going to be sharing a bathroom with the twelfth grader would be, yep. would be probably. But, uh, understandable. Nobody, nobody's going yep. <laughs> to sign up for that. Yep. Yeah. I think it would be an interesting discussion as a, in a, as a community to hear from the fifth through eighth grade teachers, for instance, and just the give and take of what their perceptions of the kids mm -hmm. in those age groups need. Um, because it is an important discussion, both emotionally and, and academically, and every other way. Just writing down the, is the important. It is just be mu as I look at the time. We really should move on. Uh, are there other questions or concerns before we move to the next item? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you for an in-depth presentation um, with lots to think about. So next, we've got uh, ne discussing negotiations with unions. That's you. So something you wanted to do in open session? Um. There's, we should talk a little bit kind of in, in closed session, especially on the, kind of the salary increase piece and whatnot for better budget planning. But, um, you know, a lot of it is just, it's waiting um, to see what happens. There has been a little bit of discussion by some groups um, about whether they are going to hold off a year. Right? If, they come to a, 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 if they come to a decision, if they come to a conclusion of not having it be enacted next year but the year after, and the reason being because of the impact that it's having on the, everybody's budget process. Um, as well as the fact that everybody across the state, because of that negotiation on health care, has to renegotiate their, their CDAs with the teachers, and they can't even start that yet. You know, we're already, you know, nobody would have started in October. So um, there is some discussion about that. If that, any of that comes to fruition, um, I'll let, let folks know. But that's something that they could easily decide, um, you know, the union and the Vermont state school board could easily decide together that you know whatever we agree to let's not start it until next year so that people can get on with actually planning what they need to plan. <laughs> uh, my suggestion if it goes out. Yeah. So yeah. other than that we're kind of in a holding pattern until January. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is to discuss a possible adjustment to in a to a policy policy to recognize staff. We started talking about this at the last meeting, I believe. Um, we were going to get a copy of our policies and look at it. Um, Paul and I both have something to that we saw that caught our eye in, in regards to this. I, um, when I looked at the governing style of the school board, 
point two, it says the board will direct, control, and inspire the organization through the careful establishment of broad written policies reflecting our values and perspectives. Um, and to me, inspiring an organization is part of that, is to recognize the staff um, at certain parts of their uh, work with us. Paul looked at uh, the essential works of school boards and also had um, some language in there that seemed to... Yeah, so essential, uh, last time I brought up that it was a best practice for, for boards to recognize um, of staff members and it was uh, brought into doubt that that was a best practice. So I looked into our superintendents, or excuse me, our school board uh, manual, if you will. It's, it gives recommendations to boards and in it, it has indicators of success under the monitoring learning outcomes. And one of the indicators of success, if you go uh, to a page that has different indicators, it says indicators of achievement in school quality. And for teacher-based indicators, one of the, it lists several, one of them is identify teacher expertise, experience, and recognition awards. And so it seems that if our association is recommending for us to do these types of things, and our superintendent has said that there are several awards he would like to see us uh, start to award. It would make sense for us to start to do that. And I, I think Laura has pointed out that I, I think our policies do not say anything about not doing something along these lines. And in fact, would encourage us to do something along these lines. And so I would, again, propose that we move forward and start finding a way to recognize staff members at Pat Lane's uh, recommendation. Is there any other discussion on this? I'm okay with it. I was the one that brought up, but it, before, my concern was that it seemed like your concern was then that you were going to, we needed to give somebody some award because we helped negotiate the teacher's contract. And my feeling was, giving somebody a gold star after you've pulled their salaries down or removed their health care is not going to really, it's not going to do too much for morale. And I didn't understand that it's Lane that's going to be right. telling us who he wants us to recognize. That is more appropriate in my view, is that because he is responsible for managing staff. And if he wants to have us present the award or whatever. I'm, so I'm totally to on board in the minutes that. or something like that. Or yes, so a letter he was trying that. to actually tell you what he wanted, uh, what he uh, would have recommended, but they kept getting interrupted. I mean, perhaps he would like to share what he has shared. I think the the ones that I've seen that happen most frequently in terms of board recognition, the, the, the first one and probably the most important one, at least to me, is. Um, that September meeting um, is the teachers that have, have, have achieved tenure. Mm -hmm. um, having them in, um, you know, have a little kind of uh, meet and greet before they're formally recognized, give them a little gift, because that's a huge step. Um, I mean, that's the equivalent of a doctor getting a cup. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's a big deal. Um, other pieces that um, have been recognized and I think are, are incredibly um, important um, is longevity, you know, years of service, um, usually starting at, at year 25 mm -hmm. and every five years thereafter, and then retirements. Mm -hmm. um, and usually those are recognized um, on that very first day of school, you know, how we do that kind of the opening day, the board, mm -hmm. one of the board members will come in and say a few words, it's usually done at that time, um, would be ideal, um, my recommendations. Year 25 seems like a long time to go are there any other discussions or considerations on this topic? Do I have a motion? Are we ready to present a motion um, about a teacher or staff recognition in the ways that uh, Lane has suggested we do so? Well, he's going to do the work, right? He's going to tell us. We, we order it. We yeah, you're going to, yeah. so we just, you just want us, is it, it would I just want clarification, you just board, want yeah. us to be 
their you are the ones doing the actual and doing the, 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 the award. Yeah. It would be yeah. from the school boards on the school behalf of the school board. It's the school board's recognition. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so Lane is suggesting example, when those would be. Yeah, we would say mm -hmm. a teacher re is retiring. Mm -hmm. Right. The uh, Lane would notify us that this teacher is retiring, and then we would write a card for this person and give the uh, uh, whatever we've come up with as the. Uh, uh, award or, or, or whatever that is given to this person for retirement, but we would be the people actually doing the card saying, mm -hmm. you know, thank you for your service to our school to or, our you know, mm -hmm. yeah. that okay. kind of thing. Yeah, I guess it wouldn't be Lane right. doing it, it'd be us, but Lane would be telling us who, who is it up. is. Right. Right. Because mm -hmm. how it's up, we wouldn't know that. Right, right. Who's the same thing with the, as he's saying, the tenure part. He would tell us who they are, and then we would recognize them at the beginning of our board meeting, or the beginning of the school year, or, or whatever year, sort of whatever. event that the yeah. teachers would be present for. Right. Well, and again, I guess I still sort of feel like that's the manager's responsibility. Not really. I mean, I'm 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 okay with us, I guess, moving into that realm, but I mean, I just was at my annual meeting today for my organization, and it's not the board of VZAC that is awarding, it's the CEO of VZAC calling up people who've done 20 years, people who've done 35 years, That that's who who does it. But that seems to say that we do it. No, yeah. Right, so, and, so. but that I is not our policies. These are our policies. That is, our policies. So I'd like to no, our we policies are right here. So we can add a motion to add a policy for this? And then that would solve the problem? Right. We could. To okay, I'd like to move to add a policy yes. to yeah. recognize To staff. modify the policy. Yes. But know. didn't the policy, what you read, yeah. to me it seems covered. like it, it covers it's, it. Covered. That's more appropriate. Yeah, that's it, the. It covers it. So it seems to me that it's. Yeah, within this the one could we fit have. underneath yeah. this policy that we already have in place. And since we aren't restricted from doing it, therefore right. it's okay. But do you guys understand my reason for being concerned about it? Absolutely. He is responsible for it, it's that it's that making sure you're clear on who is in charge of who. We are in charge of him. We do not direct staff, and this just. It makes me a little uncomfortable. I will just say it makes me a little uncomfortable because this is sort of a, you're, you're thinking of it as sort of a morale boosting or, uh, uh, I think we're, I mean, we're involved in the expectations too. Gesture. Yeah. I, just I, right. a, a gesture of respect. Yeah. Right, and, but, I, and maybe I'm reading too much into yes. it, but I just, and again, the negotiations, if we look at our policies and if you understand how we're governing, that's really, we're, we're there in support of him as he negotiates, mm -hmm. but he's the one deciding and he's got to work on providing that morale, that, that his relationship with his staff people and, and Yes, we need to, as as the board, it would be nice for some of us to be there in recognizing staff, but that's his realm, and I just want to make sure that we're staying clear with what we're doing and the purpose and what is what the concern is. And initially, I thought the concern was, well, we're negotiating and and you know, teachers might not be feeling really, that's our only interaction with teachers. But our interaction, we aren't supposed to be directing teachers. Mm -hmm. He directs the teachers. So that's where I wanna make sure that we're very clear with who's delegating, and who has what authority and responsibility. And our responsibility is to be directing him. Mm -hmm. He directs his staff from that point on, unless, we want to throw out our governance style and choose a different model. But if we're going to be following this model of governance, we need to follow it. That's my only concern. So, and this seems okay. I'm I'm willing to go with it. You can vote no too if you'd rather. Yeah. So I make a motion that we move forward and participate in recognition of our staff 
and teachers when they hit milestones or other special occasions as a board. Second. Is there any further discussion around this motion? Can we add to that? that is by recommendation of the superintendent? Into the yeah. motion? Oh. Yeah. I will modify my motion to include <laughs> that you will work collaboratively with uh, the superintendent on those recognitions. Do I have a second for the amended motion? So moved. So I hear a motion proposed that we would, um, in, accor in accordance with the superintendent's recommendations, we would, as a board, recognize teachers for tenure, retirement, and perhaps longevity. For the superintendent. Okay. Linda, you got it? <laughs> I'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we ready for a vote? Yes. yes. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the motion is carried. Um, Next, we have uh, a second read. Um, we need to accept EL reports 2.1 and 2.2. We looked over them last month. Um, I know I personally went into the superintendent's office and reviewed the reports there with uh, any further documentation. I, I personally had no other questions for Lane. Um, do I have, uh, does anyone else right now have questions for Lane on these reports? Is there a motion to accept EL reports 2.1 and 2.2 as written and discussed last time? I'll make that motion. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, next we have um, a report on the DSBA and DSA annual meeting, which uh, Ann and I attended last week and we did as well. Ann, is there something you would like to report on? Um, yeah, I would say um, the uh, the keynote speaker was, I thought, very, uh, very good. And in listening to it, um, what came to mind for me is um, it's been several years, and I and I. I don't know how many, but I think it's been at least five or, or not five, 10 or 15 years since we um, went out to the community and came up with our ends. And we have been talking about, um, you know, we need to connect with the, the community in order to share sort of how we're doing with our ends. I had a, a fairly lengthy conversation with Lane during, uh, during the conference time, um, where he was like, it would be would be helpful for him to sort of know what the priorities are for the community, um, and so I just felt reinvigorated for um, just sort of pushing to have us um, spend some time uh, connecting with folks in our community and revisiting those ends again to sort of make sure we are. Uh, on track with sort of where we want the district to be. Many other districts are, are a lot further behind. They're not operating the way we do in that they haven't really gone out to their communities and, and had those discussions. And we have several new board, board people who um, were not here when we initially created the ends that we are now trying to hold our superintendent um, to. And even our superintendent wasn't in mm -hmm. his position when those ends were developed. So um, we wouldn't, my, my, um, my thinking is we wouldn't necessarily redo the whole thing, but just um, sort of I would encourage us as a board to consider just checking back in with our community um, in some fashion to uh, make sure we're still on track and then as a board also take a look at again we have kindergartners kindergartners starting now what what is it that the experts are telling us in terms of what skills do they need 
to be able to uh, pursue their next steps in their lives, you know, 12 years from now, because things are changing so dramatically. And there's um, the the keynote had 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 a lot of resources, a lot of suggestions for things to read, some things to look at, and a whole plan for, you know groups to do that if they've never done it before and and um, and when I asked a few questions she said uh, you know if you have done this type of work before it is appropriate to then go out and just recheck in with those groups and and make sure that you're on track and that you're um, the outcomes you're looking for are still um, what the community wants and according to what Experts are saying is will be important right. I mean, in our, our future. Our three-year-old pre-Ks that we have in our district now aren't our next year aren't going to be graduating until 2035. That seems like a long time away. Right. I'm sure things will change dramatically. It was framed as portrait of a graduate or portrait of a mm -hmm. student, which was an interesting way to look at it. Mm -hmm. it, it provided a good framework. Okay. Um, Consent agenda, we need to approve the minutes from um, our last meeting in October. So moved. Second. Any corrections? All those in favor of approving the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, and then we need to approve professional contracts. This list is the three. Actually, the, the last one on there does not have the contract yet because he hasn't had a chance to come in and see Blaine. Okay. I thought we would get him in the seventh grade teacher. Patrick, yeah, Patrick Martin. He'll be here next time. Okay. And he's not starting now. But yeah, January. long term. Long term, yeah, sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we just have two names here. Um, uh, an RUHS physical ed teacher and a... Uh, R E S academic interventionist. So do I have a motion to approve professional contracts for these two? I make the motion to approve the two contracts. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next we have uh, the superintendent's report. Is there anything to add to um, it or to what your presentation was previously? Um, I think just uh, Kind of a thank you and kind of an introduction. I mean, you know, Steve Croucher was with us for three years, um, and um, he's moved on to the Carolinas. His his uh, his new wife um, got a position at Shriners Hospital. I believe she's an occupational therapist, um, and is running uh, a unit down there. Um, so he moved down to be with right her. Um, so he has done an exceptional um, job. I have not seen the passion. For that position, um, anywhere else that I've been, been in my career, which was was always a joy to, to sit down and, and talk with him. So I wish him well. Um, I know his mountain biking adventures are not over um, at this point in time, and you know that was the big question when he left. You know, are you actually going to go back to work? Or are you going to go to mountain bike um, full time? I, I didn't get an answer out of him when I talked to him. So he, so he's definitely thinking about it. But um, also um, to welcome um, Benjamin Diller. Um, Benjamin is coming to us from New York where he was an athletic recruiter for St. Rose College. Um, he has a bachelor's degree in education, a master's degree in sports leadership. Um, he has coached at the college level and at the youth level. Um, and he has stepped in, stepped up, um, he's up and running. Um, I asked people to go gently on him for the first year until he gets a full <coughs> round of athletic seasons under his belt. Um, but he's a, a wonderful addition. Um, especially couldn't couldn't have asked for better. Especially given the time of year that you know we're making the transition. Um, but I do want to welcome him, um, and uh, you know we wish him all the best. Um, the other piece that I, I think that's important um, to spend a few moments to talk about is there are some commendations that I'm going to be giving out um, at the next next faculty meeting. Um, and that is for the integrated field review that just happened. Um, so last week, and that was kind of going on at the same time that you know we had the, the conference. 
um, was the AOE with some outside teachers came in um, to take a look at the schools in the district and kind of rate us in terms of how we're doing um, relative to the state's quality standards. Um, so we had a fabulous team um, led by Melinda Robinson and Lisa Floyd um, who came together um, to host that event, um, to plan it all out, to collect the evidence that they needed to review, um, and to get everything set up for that day so that it was productive and enjoyable. And so I want to commend them and I want to thank them all for that work. Um, but they will be getting written commendations from me for that work, um, for volunteering their time to do that. Um, it was truly exceptional. And I'll be excited to see what, what, what happens in terms of the report that comes out from the visiting team. When will that be available for us to look at? I have to have my debrief with Lisa and Melinda, um, and I should be able to give you a time frame. Um, usually they try to do it, if it's anything like NEASC, which is what it's based on, um, usually they try to do it within a month. So they did a, a lot of writing that afternoon, um, the different teams that were going out looking at the quality standards. So. But that's it for me. Okay. So those are important ones. Mm -hmm. All the other reports were enclosed in our agenda. Is there anything you wanted to add or have us notice about the financial report? Um, actually, yeah. Financials were good. Um, they're where they where they should be. Um, maintenance is overspending a little bit, but that's to be expected. They've got Steve Nonemaker, who's a, our HVAC person that we hired. So a lot of it, he's just he's doing a tremendous amount of work on on the heating and cooling systems as well as plumbing. So a lot of it's just buying the materials he needs. Um, so we're not not paying for the actual work um, at this point point in time like we would be if we were contracting out. So that's been great. But on the um, the very first page. Um, you go down to the bottom, so out of the revenue side, and you look at line 10 where it says building maintenance fund, and you go over to 119960 that's the cost of Raven, and it is complete. And that includes the demolition of the old building. Excellent. Very nice. And then what will happen with that is that's out of the reserve fund. Uh, Robin's normal procedures at the end of the year, if there's money in surplus, um, she'll replace it. Great. And that building's working well and serving the needs of the kids? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, change is tough. Um, it's a little bit, um, classrooms, classroom space is a little bit larger, but the building overall is a little bit smaller. Um, but I think they're happy. They, it took a while to get some of the contractors to kind of finish up the work at the end. Mm -hmm. um, but they just wrapped up kind of a major um, electrical upgrade um, today, um, which was kind of already paid for. We were just waiting for it um, to help them get in, get online some of the heavier equipment that they've got. But at that point in time, you know, check on folks they are done. So okay. in pretty good shape. Nice Promethean board in there to teach from. Nice modern classroom. Everything's beautiful, new. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful location for the students. You do a tour sometime. You can do that and do it. I'll get the kids to put together a video tour. Yes. A good one. Like that. And uh, yeah. some of the other kids have noticed it. My son, one of the days after school, they walked up up street. And the doors were open, and he yeah. noticed that there was a uh, you know a cool new classroom in there. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, that's good. They've looked at it. You know, they've noticed it walking by. Yeah, they even got the sign up, which is awesome. They got the new sign up. So we're excited. Raven too. Is there any other incidental information? No. Nope. Okay, time for the board evaluation. Um, got a lot of fours. Uh, put a three on our inside track, but they were good conversations. Um, attendance was, you know, got everyone here, so we get a five, but mostly fours and a couple threes. Anything else that we should know? Nope. Thank you. And I. I believe we do have um, an executive session both for negotiations and personnel. Is that correct? Okay.